plan some good morning to all of you. I was pleasantly anticipating uh, Dr. Park's rendition on that guitar. I don't see him play very often. I was hoping I would hear something from him today, maybe later. You know, the enemy is doing things like that. Whenever he knows that the people of God would be profiting from something, like a musical rendition, uh, he does something. And sometimes the Lord allows him to do those things. So we will be reminded, we will be watchful of the things that we need to do. I'm very happy to be here with you again today and praying that the Lord will bless us as we listen to his words. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you once more for this opportunity we can gather together to study your words. I pray that you'll bless us and keep us in your hands and lead us to an understanding of your will for us. Fill us, O oh Father, with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our title today is One Versus All. It seems not to fit our subject because it appears our subject is about one against the world or something against everything. Well, actually, our subject is really that. One man's discovery and all the effort he took to obtain what he discovered. He went all out to obtain that very significant something. He fought, I'd like to imagine, against all odds to acquire what he deemed was most vital for him. It appears also that the storyteller tells us the same thing. And if we are wise, we shall have the same perspective. The flip side of it is that having a perspective other than what the storyteller has will uncover the kind of believers we are. That can be pretty revealing and pretty dangerous as well. Having a perspective differing from that of the storyteller makes us, I'd say, pretentious, phony, really not different from the Pharisees and the like during the days of Jesus. For who amongst us will not treasure the kingdom of heaven? Who amongst us will not say we are willing to give all up if it means entering into that heavenly realm? And who amongst us will gladly Take a cut in pay, say one year's salary, if that is what it takes to enter into the glories of heaven. Or are we willing to go through such things as I am suggesting? Before you blurt out, yes, consider the overall cost. And having said that, let us consider the parable of the hidden treasure. It's found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Just one line, just one verse, but it says pretty much powerful things for us. Jesus is the one speaking. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Many of us would be willing to go through the experience of the man in this parable. Not too long ago, somebody was so astounded having discovered a veritable treasure trove right in his friend's land. Tell Herbert. from England, bumped into the cache of gold and silver pieces in what was once Mercia, one of the five main Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And 
the cash of gold and silver is found to date between 675 to 725 AD. Experts predicted that Herbert and his friend should expect to receive each a seven-figure sum for the discovery made last July 5. Here and there, everywhere, you find people stumbling into hidden treasures. Here and there, you find people very much amazed and very happy for having found such treasures. Here is a more startling discovery made by a farmer. He and his wife went to a country fair. And as they were there looking around, this farmer became so fascinated by the airplanes and asked a pilot, how much would a wild ride cost? The pilot said, $10 for three minutes. The farmer said, that's too much. The pilot thought for a second and said, I'll make you a deal. If you and your wife ride for three minutes without uttering a sound, the ride will be free. But if you make a sound, you have to pay $10. Seems like a fair deal. Okay. The farmer and his wife agreed and went for a real wild ride. After they landed, the pilot said to the farmer, I want to congratulate you for not making a sound. You are a very brave man. Maybe so, said the farmer. But I got to tell you, I almost screamed when I looked to my left and discovered that my wife fell out. <laughs> You don't want that kind of discovery for yourself. <laughs> but really now, who would not be jumping for joy upon discovering a treasure trove right in the land you are working on? Apparently, in our parable, the discoverer of the treasure does not own the land. The parable tells us for so he went all out to purchase the land to acquire the treasure he discovered. Let's make a quick analysis. In the versions we have today, uh, you find the word again, begin that uh, parable. Doubtless that was an insertion indica indicating that the parable was really part of a series told by Jesus, focusing on the significance of the kingdom of heaven. The treasure is found by a poor man like me. He comes across it, or he came across it by accident. He was engaged in his daily toil, expecting little, rather bored that he plowed as he went through his plowing business in the field. Boom! Suddenly, his plowshare hit a box. Quickly he dug it up, opened it, and precious jewels cascaded from it. He was thrilled no end. And quickly he hid that treasure again until he could go and buy that field. Some scholars, some students, trying to put in some measure of uh, interpretation, said that the action of that guy hiding the treasure is a little bit ethically dubious. What he should have done is told the owner about it and uh, let the owner do something. If the owner wanted to give him his share, then so be it. ethical and dubious, but not from the standpoint of Jewish law. Because the rabbis said, if a man, if a man finds a scattered money, it belongs to the finder. Um, in the world there is such a saying as finders, keepers. Well, that is not the point of the parable. 
That is not the point of the parable. Some people discovered the worth of the kingdom by accident. They are following the familiar routine of life when suddenly against all expectations they find a treasure. They discover the treasure. And if you try to go back to the parable of the pearl of great price, you'll find out that there is a little bit of contrast here with that parable because the parable of the pearl of great price is a parable where you have a man looking for something. He has been working as a pearl merchant all his life and he wanted to find that one pearl that will make a difference. In this parable, that's not the case. The farmer stumbled into that treasure. And what a treasure he found. When we try to work on it in our own context, what is that treasure? The treasure is Jesus. It was Jesus that we can discover. What a marvelous picture of discovering Jesus for the joy of finding the kingdom of heaven in Jesus, or to say, to say it directly, the joy for the joy of finding Jesus and in the subsequent willingness to give up everything else for this Jesus. The parable gives us a very, very graphic portrayal of the worth of the kingdom. Although some people look at it as a sacrifice done by the treasure finder, it is wrong to use the word or even to suggest it that the man sold all he had in order to buy something of greater, far greater value. That is not the point. Because the man who sold all he has or gave up all he had did it in the context of joy. Truly, a person who discovers Jesus is a person who will go through the heights of joy never experienced by those who have not discovered the real worth, the true worth of Jesus. You remember that song? I have a joy, joy, joy down in my heart. As a child, I used to sing that very much and I still sing it. It is a song I heard long, long ago as a child and I sang it as an innocent child and sang it with joy and gusto oblivious to the problems and travails that adult life would bring. People would say that it is true that, it, that you have joy down in your heart when you sing it only as a kid. But as you grow up, you discover and you become wise in the ways of the world and you suddenly find that it has become a sacrifice, a kind of sacrifice to follow Jesus. Some people look at it that way. Let me ask you this question. Do you find it a sacrifice to follow Jesus? Or do you find following Jesus a joy? I think for those people who think that following Jesus is a way of sacrificial life is something that they have something in their minds that they have not probably discovered about Jesus. And I will really disagree with them because if you really came to know Jesus and discovered him as the one heaven sent to obtain your salvation and salvation at such a price, you will truly have joy. You can only bow your head or probably shout at the discovery that Jesus died for you. And knowing that his death enabled you, gained for you entry into that glorious kingdom of heaven, which you would not have otherwise reached, you cannot have any other feeling but that of joy. Joy comes from a heart full of gratitude and praise. Joy comes from a mind having understood that I am nothing and Jesus made me something by his death on the cross. Before Jesus, 
I was nobody. Before Jesus, I am a sinner destined for death. Before Jesus, I am a man damned. Jesus came. Jesus saved me. Would I not be happy? Would I not have joy? Did you hear the story about a slave who was sold against his wishes? There was this slave. He was sent to the marketplace together with all the slaves and he's got a different perspective about being a slave. Being a slave. And as he was standing there, people came and uh, looked at the slaves from head to foot. But because this slave is a lot more muscular, more powerful looking than the others, many people came to see him. But as they came near him, they would after a while leave him to his own because he was uttering something not expected of a slave. He was saying, buy me, me no Lord. Buy me, me no Lord. Who would buy a slave like that? Buy me, me no Lord. He would utter as its prospective buyer comes to him. Buy me, me no Lord. Buy me, me no Lord. Pretty soon, there was a daring master who came. He looked at him from head to foot, went to the seller, gave him money, and told the slave, follow me, buy me, me no work. Buy me, me no work. Couldn't do anything, however, so he followed his new master. Road into the on the carriage and uh, all the while from the market to the place of the new master, this servant was muttering, "Buy me, me no work. Buy me, me no work." Until they got to the most lovely mansion that this slave had ever seen, but he kept on talking still to himself and to the hearing of his new master, buy me, me no work. As they alighted on the horse-drawn carriage, this master, new master, went to the side of his uh, new slave and surprisingly untied the hands of this slave and looking straight into the eyes of the slave, he said, Go, you're free. What? Buy me, me no work. You don't need to say that because I did not buy you to make you a slave. You're free. All of the hatred, all of the negative feelings, Everything, possibly even in the mind and the heart of that slave, suddenly disappeared with the realization that he has been freed. And in a moment of gratitude to his new master, he fell on his face, wrapped his hands on the legs of his new master, and he told his master, I serve you forever. I serve you forever. I work for you forever. The person who discovers Jesus as the treasure of the kingdom of heaven is a person who will be joyful for the privilege of having discovered Jesus. That's why the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of heaven that will be meant 
only as a place for those who would understand who Jesus is. The joy of discovering what Jesus did for that master or for that slave, and the joy of discovering what Jesus did for me, for all of that, I will be willing to give up everything for him. And yes, I think even if I have to give up everything for the joy of having Jesus in my life, I think it's all worth it. Some people may call it sacrifice, but I would insist on calling it a joyful experience. I was wondering what was going through the mind of the person who penned the lyrics of the song, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. To have Jesus is to have life. To have Jesus is to obtain the greatest treasure this world could ever give. To have Jesus is to have the assurance of entry into the glorious kingdom of God. Ah, Jesus. He is the sweetest, His is the sweetest name I know. And it's just the same as His lovely name. And that's the reason why I love Him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Friends, brethren, I bring before you Jesus, the treasure par excellence. To have Him is the joy of life. To have Jesus is to have the assurance of entry into the glories of His kingdom. Once more, let me tell you this. God's kingdom beckons. God's kingdom is for us to possess. God's kingdom is for us to enter into. And the only way by which we can gain entry into that glorious kingdom is by way of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Would I be willing to go all out? Maybe sell everything I have? To purchase this treasure so wonderful? Treasure that does not come very often? Treasure that if I do not give it to, I am placing myself again on that path that leads to damnation. Hear, O people of God, behold Him who died for you and for me. This Jesus is the treasure, the hidden treasure that has now been manifested, bared for all to see. I am pretty sure that one way or the other, some of you have encountered Jesus either by accident or by some circumstance. However you encountered Jesus, however you stumbled into Him, let me tell you this. It is only by connecting with Jesus that we find joy. It is only by being with Jesus that we obtain meaning to life. I've had, I've had the experience of meeting many, many miserable people. I have a friend who was so miserable that the first thing that he would say as he gets out of bed is, what a dreary day. And throughout the day, he does nothing but complain and complain and complain and complain. He goes to bed saying, ah, truly, it has been a dreadful, dreary day. Day in and day out. He would be that kind of person. One time, he surprised me because for the first time in my life, when I saw him next, he was so happy. 
It was so joyful. And I asked him, what happened to you? Did you, did you have uh, some pill given to you by your doctor? What happened to you? I discovered Jesus. Amazing! Hallelujah! I discovered Jesus. I didn't know that I was missing so much in life. We need to discover who Jesus is. I know that many of you, or probably all of you, need not be bothered by this preacher saying things about Jesus. But I am also telling you that although I am a preacher, although I am a pastor, there are many, many times, frequent times, when I have to come to my Jesus and tell him, Lord Jesus, help me once more to stumble into you. Help me once more to find you and the beauty of your words. Help me to stumble into you and to find and to discover what you want me to find about you. Because as a treasure troll, the more we come to Jesus, I don't care whether you are a pastor, an elder, a student, a PhD degree holder, all of us, at one time or another, we need to have that assurance from God that there are still things that we can find in Jesus. And like, like hidden treasure, the more you dig into the life and my Lord Jesus, the more you will find treasures beyond your comprehension. I've been a minister now for how many years? I entered the ministry in 1976. I get into many situations, circumstances that are sometimes discouraging. But I never felt so happy as when I am really studying the words of Jesus. There are new gems that come out of the mind of Jesus. New truths. Because there is a tendency for most of us to think that, hey, what is more to be learned from Jesus in the Bible? Sorry. If that is your way of looking at Jesus, I think you have got stale in your Christian life. There is a need for you to stumble again into this treasure called Jesus. Because as you learn more of Him, as you become more familiar with Him, the Lord's going to give you more joy. And the Lord's going to make your life more meaningful. And the Lord will make you a better instrument, a better witness for Him. The kingdom of heaven beckons. We cannot enter into it with simply what we know now. Because what we know now might not be enough to help us develop a character that will fit us for heaven. That will fit us into the kingdom. Jesus, the Lord said through her, through his servant, when the character of his children When the character of Jesus has been manifested in his children, then he will come to claim them as his own. I was wondering, is it because the character of Jesus has not been manifested yet in us 
that the Lord, some people are saying, that the Lord is forced to delay His coming? No. I don't know. This is one thing I do. Like Paul. Forgetting the things that are behind and pressing on towards the mark. Jesus, the joy of life. Jesus, the joy of living. Jesus, the treasure towards us going into the glories of the kingdom. I am still a student of the Word. And today, I'd like to pray for all students like me. There is so much to learn about Jesus. And I pray that we will all learn together until His character gets reflected in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that you called us not just to be your children, but to be your students. As we look into your words, help us to discover, to discover gems, truths, treasures that will help us obtain a better understanding of you, who you are as a God, and of who Jesus is as our Savior. And lead us, Father, help us not to be discouraged when we sometimes run into a wall and there seems to be nothing beyond that wall. Give us rather patience. Give us forbearance. Give us, O oh Lord, your spirit. That your spirit may lead us into understanding all truth. And give the joys of living to our hearts. Make us joyful in Jesus. And make us joyful until we see him face to face. Oh, bless all the students, Father. Grant wisdom and understanding to all of them. Grant them healthy bodies so that they can carry on with their studies in a way that will honor and glorify you. Bless also their families. Bless their studies. Leave them. Grant them the thoughts that you want them to have. And when all is said and done, and Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven, all of us who have looked forward to the coming of Jesus will find ourselves ready to enter into the glories of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.